Huge thanks to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. If you've ever struggled to do an integral analytically on pen and paper, and you've been within like shouting distance of a professor or like a research advisor, then without a doubt, you've heard them give you the suggestion of just doing it numerically to get some, some intuition for the function that you're integrating. So today is all about how to just do it numerically. We're gonna do a numerical integral of a multivariable function in Python so that anybody can access this kind of code and run it for themselves pretty much right out of the box if you have Anaconda installed on your computer. Uh, so this is something that I always kind of forget how to do every now and then, especially once I'm doing numerical integrals uh, of functions where the limits themselves are functions of the variables being integrated. That's when things I think get a little bit more tricky with numerical integration. So I thought this video might shed some light on that. So we're gonna do this example that I just kind of came up with. We have a function that's a three dimensional Gaussian and some parameter A, which is not going to be integrated over. And we're just gonna write a simple little script that integrates this function uh, x, y, and z from zero to one. So we know this integral of this Gaussian, which is bell-shaped curve, is going to be proportional to the cube of an error function. That's just what you end up getting when you integrate Gaussians uh, over like finite limits. So we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this numerically, and then we're gonna do it again when uh, the limits of integration are restricted and are functions of the variables being integrated. So let's go ahead and just let's start doing it. So all I have so far are just the libraries that we're importing that we're gonna need to actually run the code. Uh, NumPy for arrays, functions, common functions, common constants. We want to make some plots and compare things later. And then SciPy has the integrator that we're going to be using. And it also knows what the error function is. So step one, pretty self-explanatory. Let's go ahead and define the function that we want to integrate. So we have f of... Now, the most important thing for these kinds of integrals, that, as I've come to learn... The hard way is that the, the order of the variables is very important for the function. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, it assumes that the first argument is the first thing being integrated. Uh, so we're gonna, we're integrating over z, then x, or sorry, we're doing z, then y, then x. So z, y, x, and then we have a remaining parameter, which is a. And we're just gonna return this Gaussian. Dot exponential minus a times x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So this is our function. And so, so we're clear integrating z, then y, then x, and a is a parameter. Okay. Now we need to define the ranges for, uh, for the variables, x, y, and z. So this is the thing that's gonna change quite a bit. This is where things get a little bit more complicated when we have uh, limits of integration that are functions of the variables. If we were just inter interested in constant integrals, I wouldn't make this video. I just think it gets a little confusing once you wanna do that kind of stuff. And for what I do, uh, I have to do these things called Feynman parameter integrals all the time, which always have variables in the integration limits. So, and I always forget how to do these. So this will be useful for me. So, um, the ranges for the first case, they're all constants, they're all the same. Range x is just some list, 0 to 1. And the same thing goes for y and z. Okay, and now we just need to define the integral. Define, in this case it's i1, I'm going to call it s for reasons that will be clear in a minute. And now we just want to return the integral. Return. What are we integrating? We're integrating f, and the ranges in order of what we're integrating are z, range z, range y, and range x. And lastly, we wanna tell it to expect that there's one additional parameter a. For whatever reason, it expects uh, a tuple, so even if you just have one additional parameter, you still have to have this comma. Now, why am I calling it I1S? Well, if we were to say evaluate this integral I1 for some particular value of A, let's choose A equal to zero because that's one we can all do. If the Gaussian has A equal to zero, then it's just one. And the integral of one from zero to one is just one. So if we evaluate this integral I1S, we get the value of 1.0. 
as well as the relative uh, error. I don't. I, I'm a little skeptical about the error of how it does like these exact answers. Uh, typically, when I have something that's not a pretty number, it's more along the order of like 10 to the minus eight. But okay. So the first, it gives you two options or it gives you two pieces of information, the value of the integral and the error. So if I wanna just access one of them, I just index it with a zero to get the value of the integral or one to get the uncertainty. Now, the reason I'm calling this S is S stands for scalar because the args, not only are the args is expecting A to just be a number. If I were to create some array, A vals equals, let's call it A val, some lin space zero. Let's do epsilon to five, 10, 10 points, and epsilon is equal to 10 to the minus six. This is just because of how we're representing the value of the integral. There's this one over a here, so I don't wanna, it's, it's well defined at a equal to zero, but how we're representing it, it might freak out. So let's just bypass the, the pole it might think there is. Uh, and so if we pass our integrator a val, it's going to freak out because it's expecting a scalar and we sent it an array instead. So how do we make it so that this integrator can uh, accept an array of parameters of a certain parameter? Find out after a message from our sponsors. If you're watching a coding video, I'll take a shot in the dark and assume you spend a lot of your time working at a desk. By working at a desk, I mean scrolling through Reddit and social media until your code finishes running. Now, I did the math so that you don't have to, and in grad school alone, I've spent around 10,000 hours doing physics and playing RuneScape, but mostly the physics part. That's about 10,000 hours hunched over, scribbling on a sheet of paper, because let's be honest, does anyone actually work this way? No, my back has been really crappy for quite a few years now, and I recently made it even worse, so I was really happy when FlexiSpot reached out to me to see if I'd like to try out one of their desks. So they sent me over this 48-inch bamboo wood desktop, and I've been using it for a couple weeks now. Now you can choose your own desktop. As I said, I got the wooden bamboo kind because it feels it feels like the good desk from high school. I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the glossy bullshit with the rounded sides that barely covers half your thigh. No, I'm talking about the beefy wooden one that made you feel safe, that was big enough for a human-sized person with a human-sized workload. Now I want you to take that desk, give it about 48 by 24 square inches of real estate to spread out on, throw in some leg room and electronics. You can easily adjust the height of the desk continuously from the minimum height of a little over 28 inches to a max height of about 48 inches. So you can take a break from all the sitting and stretch your legs for a bit while you work. Now I haven't gotten too much use out of the standing aspect of the desk yet, but because you can set the height anywhere between its minimum and its highest point, I've been using one of the four presets to set the desk to a height where my laptop screen is approximately eye level, that way I'm not angling my head down a lot because that's been putting a lot of strain on my upper back lately. So if you're thinking, wow, I really like that desk, first of all, thanks, it has pockets. The desk does have a little drawer. It's pretty wide, actually. You can fit a few notebooks in there, some pens and stuff like that. It's a bit shallow, though. You can't fit too much in there, but still really nice to have. Overall, I'm very happy with the desk. I think you could really call it a stand-up product. And you can get one for yourself or someone you love by clicking the link in the description. And huge thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. And we're back. Okay, so we've passed the integral an array like a dumb idiot. Now let's pass it an array like a smart idiot. And it's really easy to do this. We can just define the one that can take an array of A values to be numpy.vectorize uh, I1 scalar. So this can now, we can pass it an array, we can make a pretty plot. Let, before we do that, let's give it something to compare it to. We're saying this whole integral is supposed to be proportional to this cube of the error function. Let's define this, this uh, analytic result. So we'll call it the answer of A. It's got some proportionality equals pi over four times A to the three halves. And we're just gonna return that proportionality times uh, earth of the square root of A cubed. 
Now we can move on to the plotting. Oh no, I got rid of my a vowels and stuff. So let's let epsilon is 1.0 e to the minus six. A vowels equals in space, I forget what I had exactly, but epsilon to let's say 10 and we've got 15 points. The range doesn't matter. This is a proof of concept that we can do multi-dimensional integral that results in a function of a parameter that didn't get integrated and we can plot it and stuff like that. And it doesn't actually matter what the range is. But let's go ahead and start doing the plotting. So we wanna do, uh, let's plot <coughs> the numeric result, plt.plot a vowels, uh, i1 of a vowels. Let's do label, let's give it a name, <coughs> excuse me. Call it i1 one of a numeric uh, line style make it dashed who cares color who cares black we'll do the same thing for the analytic result that's just answer i1 analytic Tick. We'll make this one dotted, and I think we have to make it a little bit larger since they're going to overlap. Okay, uh, plt dot legend. Add some grid lines. Uh, some X labels. And let's. Let's see what we got. Boom. Oh wait, no, this is not gonna work because <laughs> uh, I1, like we said, we, it returns the value of the integral and the uncertainty. So we're just plotting the, we're just plotting the value of the integral. So we have to tell it the zero with component. So answer, uh, we don't need to do it there. I had a typo with the square root. There we go. Okay, so we plotted our numeric result. We also plotted the alleged uh, analytic result and we see a complete overlap. The uncertainty is on the order of like 10 to the minus eight or something like that. So we wouldn't even really see the error bars. So I'm not making a scatter plot of those as well, but those are there as well in principle. Uh, okay, cool. So now that we know that they overlap, we should actually give this thing a title, probably plt.title. Uh, Psych, they the same number. Here we go, now we're professionals. Cool, so that's how we can do this numerical integration for constant limits, where the limits are constants. Uh, I wouldn't have made this video if that's all that we were doing today. I think things get a little bit more tricky once we wanna have variable limits, but honestly, not that much changes. It's just a little hard to keep track of, in my opinion. So the only thing that changes for I2 Still integrating the same function over the same variables, same parameter. Only thing that's different are the limits of integration. So it shouldn't be too surprising that this is the stuff that's going to be changing. And because some of them are functions of the variables, instead of just being arrays, those arrays are going to have entries that are functions of the variables. We're not going to have to do that for x because it's got constants again. Um, we could do everything in terms of functions. That's just more function evaluations though. So at a certain point, we want these things to not be very expensive computationally. So defining the function when it doesn't need to be would be kind of dumb, I think. Okay, so the first thing, let's start with Z. Let's define uh, range. Let's call it ZZ, so it's not to be confused with the previous one. It's a function of X and Y. The thing that makes uh, limits that are functions of the variables variables tricky is if it's a function of one you gotta treat it as if it's a function of everything that remains so if we haven't integrated over z yet then we have to treat the the limits of integration as if it's functions of x y and a okay so we're going to call it as a function of y x and a if we forget that you're going to start running into it's expecting this many positional arguments and only received this that's like the most common errors that you'll see from doing these kinds of integrals. So here we're just going to return 
that list 0, 1 minus x minus y. Super simple, once you know how to do it. <laughs> now when we look at the y integral range, y, y, so this is like y equals 1 minus x, so at most it can depend on x and a. There's no, there's no y. That could be like y equals y plus whatever. Return, same list, 0, 1 minus x. And again, we could do this for, for the x integral, but it's a constant. So that's just unnecessarily making more function evaluations, I think. So range xx is just going to be a regular list. And so if we do the exact same thing now, where we'll define i2 now, the only difference is these new limits of integration. We'll call it zz, yy, and xx. And we do the exact same thing where we vectorize i2. Now for free, we can pretty much just plot uh, the exact same integral, but with a different, I guess you would say, like phase space restriction. The Gaussian's positive definite, so if we're limiting the, the limits of integration, then the, the value of the integral should probably get smaller. So if we plot, oh no, what did I do? This is the same thing, let's call it I2. I2 of a val zero, I2 numeric. Let's make these, I don't know, cyan, why not? And then now I2 is not gonna be the exact same thing. So it's like this, this, they're the same number is just a lie, except I2. There we go. So now we've retained our honesty. And there we have it. So now we have both plots of I1 analytic and numeric, which are consistent with each other, and this new plot of I2 where the only difference was that phase space restriction. The Gaussian is positive definite, so if we're basically decreasing the range of integration, it makes sense that we should get a lower value for the integrals. And that is most of what I had for you today. I wanted to, I'm constantly having to do these integrals where the limits of integration are variables. Uh, that's a very common thing to have to do when you have to consider phase space restrictions for certain measurements and particle physics experiments. And so being able to you know, pretty quickly define these different ranges for your integrals is nice to, I think, be able to reference. Um, a couple other things, like a quick way that we could generalize this a little bit more. This is a three-dimensional integral. We could have passed it n integrals, really. We've only done three. As long as you're consistent with uh, your orders of integration, right? Z comes first, then Y, because we were integrating Z first. So if we had four integrals, the same, nothing changes there. We could have also included an additional parameter like some constant value b if we wanted to. Like b is just, maybe that's the mass. It's always, maybe it's, well, let's look at it for the b equal to 1 or b equal to 5, but maybe not an array. We're just giving it a number. You can do that very easily. Just in addition to everywhere that you see a's, you also include b's. Now, if you're just giving b as a number, there's nothing you have to worry about as far as like what vectorizing does. If you start trying to pass it multiple types of arrays, well, now it really depends on what you're trying to do. So if your parameters are arrays, um, you know maybe there's some more room for customization, but it, it kind of really does start to depend a lot more on what specific problem you're trying to solve. But in any case, I hope you all find this video useful. I know in a few months when I forget how to numerically integrate again, I'll come back to this video. Um, I'm sure there will be suggestions in the comments of little tweaks and uh, improvements that you can make to this code to make it run a little bit more. Like if you have, maybe you can use the star and star for args to have, if you don't know how many arguments you're gonna have. So check the comments for people's suggestions. People always have good suggestions in the comments. Huge thanks to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. Check the link in the description for more information and to get one for yourself. And I'll see you next time.